Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all attending this workshop today on Advanced SYCL Concepts for Heterogeneous Computing. Organized by Analytics India Magazine in collaboration with Intel, in this two-hour long session, we will learn and practice the advanced concepts and features of Data Parallel C++ with live sample code on Intel Dev Cloud. Guess what? If you are a C++ or a GPU programmer, this workshop is perfect for you. To lead this webinar, we have with us Ms. Jyotsna Khemka, Software Engineering Manager at Intel Corporation, Asia Pacific and Japan South, who is an accomplished professional with about 18 plus years of industry experience in various technical and leadership roles. Jyotsna has got extensive work experience in software application development, applied research in parallel systems, parallel programming using multi-core, many-core, use of accelerators in various domains, including medical image processing, computational chemistry, and computational fluid dynamics. So welcome, Jyotsna. Along with her, we also have Ms. Subarna Rekha Gosa, a software technology consulting engineer at Intel, who is responsible for helping internal and external customers succeed on Intel platforms through the use of Intel software development tools, specifically for Intel compilers. And these two esteemed speakers today will guide us on how to write SYCL code for heterogeneous computing efficiently. They will also cover pointer-based memory management for heterogeneous computing and the implicit and explicit ways of moving memory using unified shared memory and handling data dependency between kernel executions and a lot more. Before we delve into the session, we need to take care of a few things. I request you all to please sign up for an Intel DevCloud account. This is very critical for the workshop. We are dropping the link to sign up on the chat box. So please hurry up and register on Intel DevCloud with the event code. Also, we will be taking up the Q&A for this workshop on the Discord channel. So don't forget to join us there. We are dropping the link for the Discord channel as well on the chat box. Attendees kindly note that the trainers will only be addressing questions on our Discord channel. Please use the link shared in the chat window to move over to the platform and pose your questions there. Before moving on, further, we are also running an exclusive lucky draw contest where 10 lucky participants will get a chance to win an Amazon voucher worth rupees 2,000 each. So stay tuned for the workshop and remember the winners will be selected based on their interactiveness and participation in the workshop and on the Discord channel. So stay tuned. And on that note, I would like to welcome our speakers for the day. Welcome Jyotsna and Subarna to this workshop session. With this, I will hand over the session now to Jyotsna. Over to you. Thank you, Anushka. Thanks for such a nice introduction and warm welcome here. Um, I also welcome all the attendees to this workshop, spending these two hours with us, and we would like to, to ensure that you have a good learning experience about uh, SQL programming and what Intel is offering in this particular space. So let's uh, move forward. Before we go into the SQL programming, I would like to uh, talk a little bit more about why it is important for us to learn about SQL. So if you want to talk about let's say our day-to-day -day activity, what we do, let's say you're working uh, in your home, maybe you're after some time, you might want to play a game on your laptop. You might move to your living room, watch something on the Netflix. You may want to uh, uh, go to the office and then maybe you want to continue because it's a Bangalore and it's very um, <laughs> uh, possibility that you might get stuck in traffic and you would like to use your mobile device to continue watching what you're doing. Or maybe you want to connect to the cloud and do some of your uh, banking applications. You want to do some stock exchange work you want to do. In this particular scenario, uh, what you do is you keep on moving from one device to another device and there are multiple scenario where a lot of compute goes in the background. For all these compute, this need of this compute is different because they run it on different hardware. Some of the applications which perform very good on CPU, some of the applications which perform very good on GPU. We would like to have the seamless experience when we move from device to device from one scenario to another. So what a developer gets into uh, when this kind of uh, challenges come into our day-to-day uh, -day life, right? 
when you target different kind of devices, there are different programming models available for them. If you want to uh, program for CPU, the programming model is different. For if you want to program for GPU, programming model is different. For using different programming model, you need to learn and you also want to have a kind of a learning curve for that and also maintenance of that. All this create a lot of challenge for us. So what Intel is trying to do when there is a multiple hardware architecture available, why not have a unified programming model for all of them? So that you can utilize the hardware architecture and write your code once and it can be utilized in anywhere in, in, uh, in the hardware space. To address this issue, one API programming model, which is the industry initiative, um, driven by Intel, which is open for everybody to uh, contribute, to, to make use of that so that your programming becomes much more easier. And in this space, Intel has come up with an open standard, which is based on the SQL standard. SQL is, uh, I'm sure all of you would have heard, SQL is a specification, which is available uh, as an open source to anybody to um, download and use it and even implement it. So Intel has also done a kind of implementation of SQL and which allows you to do unified programming um, experience, which can work across the architecture of CPU, GPU, or FPGA, or any other accelerator in that particular space. It is also compatible with the other programming languages, which is uh, available C, C++, Python, or OpenMP, or Fortran, or even if you're working on a distributed computing, uh, MPI is one of the programming languages. When we want to talk about industry initiatives, uh, we want to break the uh, chain of proprietary lock-in where you have uh, vendor locking when you develop any application. So one API gives you kind of a freedom of choice for different vendor of hard hardware. So it is it's, it's a kind of a smart path for freedom for accelerated computing on different architecture. So what it uh, allows you to do is if you have a different architecture underneath CPU, GPU, or FPGA, one API industry specification, it sits on top of it, and then it can also interact with your middleware. Let's say you're working on AI uh, applications, your TensorFlow, like PyTorch, or uh, any of the rendering uh, using OpenVINO. On top of that, you will have your own workload or application, which is which you'll run on the diverse platform. So one API sits in the middle, which allows you to have different type of programming experience. You can use a direct programming using SQL, which we are going to talk about in this particular workshop, or we, we can you can also use API based programming. So you can also use uh, uh, fully optimized uh, libraries, which are targeted to different kind of domain. Let's say you're working on video processing. So you have one VPL as a library, or if you're working on uh, method mathematics library so you can use mkl these libraries are uh, highly optimized for different kind of architecture so you can use these apis and you can develop your software and have a unified experience of uh, programming when we are talking about it's an industry initiative i would like to um, uh, get you an idea that uh, there are many organizations who are supporting us here the, these are the some of the names almost 103 organizations worldwide uh, started using one api and also started contributing to one api as open standard I would also like to give you another understanding uh, from one of the university from berlin who were doing the tsunami uh, application uh, easy waves simulation. So they had this application uh, developed for uh, uh, GPU, NVIDIA GPU, and then they used one API as a programming model, converted that code into SQL, and then they are able to use it on a different kind of hardware architecture they would like to. And you can uh, you can read out the, the kind of quotes uh, what our uh, partners or customers are uh, giving about one API and their experience using SQL. With that, I would like to give you a little bit more understanding how you can use one API is uh, you will also have possibility to uh, use a tool which allows you to code, uh, convert your CUDA code to SQL and then you can use the SQL as a programming language to run on multiple hardware. You also have possibility of libraries as I spoke about uh, uh, optimized library for different domains and we also give you another kind of a tool set which allows you to have a performance analysis of your tool and which you can utilize it for debugging your applications once you start developing using one API. 
with that, let me give you a little bit more details on the toolkits. It also comes with the toolkits which allows you to work on different domains. So the base is the one API based toolkit is the one basic toolkit which you need to have to getting started with one API and SQL. And if you're working on different domain, let's say for HPC, IoT or rendering, you will have a specific toolkits with that which you can download it on top of base toolkit and start using it. As uh, Anushka mentioned, we have a dev cloud. So this is a free account you can uh, create on this dev cloud where you already have one one API toolkits freely available. You can quickly get start your journey there and Subarna will help you out to run some of the samples, get you some hands on experience on one API and sickle on dev cloud. So I highly encourage you to uh, enroll yourself for dev cloud and start using a dev cloud for your um, learning experience and your application development. Here are some of the links and resources about one API about other training and webinars on on this particular space even on sickle side so you can uh, click, click on this and there is also community forum which is uh, ready to help you out if you get stuck anywhere while developing your application or running your application on heterogeneous architecture. With that, I, I, I conclude uh, my uh, talk and I will hand it over to Subarna to, to have an exciting journey in this particular session. She will help you out to understand SQL and in, in a better way and how you can program in SQL. Thank you. Uh, I don't have access to screen sharing till now, so if someone can please help me uh, with that. Yes, just a second, Sabrina. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think you can be able to present now. Yep. Thanks. One second. Okay, I am facing some difficulty. Okay. Uh, my screen is visible now, right? Uh, it was and visible also, earlier, uh, actually. You can't see it now. Yes, mm -hmm. we can yeah, see now it now. Okay, okay, great. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, today, okay, again, it's not visible, is it? Visible. Can you put it on full screen mode? Presentation mode. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine now, right? No, so when I, it was, uh, it's not visible now. It was earlier. My screen is not visible, is it? No, it's there is visible. some. Okay. Is it visible? I thought it is visible. I had duplicated also. We can yeah, see we it can now. Save now. Now it's yes, perfect. Okay. perfect. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And sorry for the inconvenience. So yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we will be going through a roller coaster ride about uh, the SQL 2020 language uh, specifications. Uh, we'll be focusing on that, and uh, we'll go through all the latest and greatest features that are available in SQL 2020. As all of you are aware, we have a time constraint for around one and a half hours. So uh, maybe uh, we'll focus mostly on three concepts. Uh, one is a unified shared memory or USM. One is subgroup and the last one is simplified reduction. We have hands on for all of these, uh, but uh, it depends on time whether we will be able to have the reduction uh, hands on. Anyway, we will have all these available in depth cloud in case we are not able to cover all the labs today. You can always go through the materials and come back to us if you have any queries about those. 
with that in uh, mind, let's start understanding uh, where the SQL language sits uh, or the one API implementation of SQL language sits. So uh, I think all the C++ developers here will be uh, well aware of C++ 17 specifications. So that's the base uh, of uh, base where the SQL language is built out of. And above that uh, sits uh, the SQL specifications. Uh, those are extensions above the C++ 17 language. And uh, on above the SQL specifications, we have uh, extensions uh, that are offered by Intel uh, to extend the language. And all of this together constitutes a one API implementation of SQL. Now, the one API implementation of SQL is also sometimes uh, like the Intel version of the one API implementation of SQL is sometimes also called as DPC++. So uh, if if anywhere DPC++ is referred to, it's just the Intel implementation of SQL. Yeah. With that concept in mind, uh, let's go ahead and uh, start understanding uh, why why SQL uh, extension uh, like SQL 2020 was so important uh, to the developer community. First is uh, it enhanced the productivity. How it enhanced the productivity? The answer to that is uh, the, it has reduced the verbosity of writing code or, or uh, the lines of code that needs to be written. How that we will see uh, when we see an example. We have a clear specifications which mentions what are the things that have been made easy in the, with the SQL 2020 coming up. Second is enhanced performance. How it has enhanced performance is some of the features like the subgroups have enabled uh, this uh, SQL uh, to take maximum advantage of the hardware underneath. Uh, with that, it gives us more performance and helps us uh, run, run the code faster on across uh, like se several platforms. And the last one is uh, it we the SQL standards. It's a, it's an open collaboration and everyone has their part to say and everyone can give their feedback, uh, do extensions to SQL. So it's a collaborative. Uh, it's a collaboration basically. And what happen, What is happening as a result is SQL is growing every day, and uh, and it's growing, taking the feedback of the community. Well, to start with, we will uh, just go through a traditional way in which the SQL code was written. So it may appear familiar for C++ developers, but yet there are many syntax which uh, you, you will feel you are not acquainted to. So I will just go line by line so that you can understand what it was about and then we will see how it has been simplified. So to start with, let me enable the pointer. To start with, uh, you can see we have uh, we always need to include uh, the SQL.hpp in our SQL code, and then uh, the namespace SQL. Uh, so after this to inclusion, we start writing our code. First step is uh, creating a queue. So why do we create a queue? Queue uh, creating a queue is uh, important because uh, we need uh, need the interface which helps uh, the data to travel from the host to device. So for that, queue helps us. Next thing what we do is we uh, this is the initialization of the data on the host side like we used to do in C normal C++ coding as well. After I have created uh, like uh, I after I have located the memory then I am and then I am initializing uh, the data. So I am initializing the data uh, with some value. The next step is a create, creating buffer, and uh, so you can see there there is a parenthesis in, inside which the entire buffer code is written. Uh, so uh, why this parenthesis is important, I will uh, come to it later. But let's go to the next step. Next step is creation of buffers. Now, what is buffer? Buffer is a data type that is accessible across the device and the host. We need a data type uh, like which which is which will be familiar across the host and device. So buffer is that data type. And in a traditional way of writing code, what we used to pass is uh, the um, like uh, what types uh, is it an integer or a float? We need to pass that and then uh, the di dimension of that. So since this is a, this is a one-dimensional array, as you can see, so we have passed one dimension here. The buffer name is buff, and we have passed the data that uh, we had allocated uh, in the host. And then we need to pass another variable called range. Uh, range is basically uh, the entire length of the array here. 
and if it's two dimensional it, it can have multiple like you can have nm etc and uh, this is the dimension here is one you can make it two three so sickle supports up to three dimensions the next step is uh, submitting the buffer so uh, submitting the buffer to the device so how do we do it uh, we create uh, the submit object from the queue and then uh, then we create a handler now what is a handler to explain that i will just tell a line about command group there is a concept called command group in queue in a sequence, sorry so what is a command group so a command group encapsulates the kernel that we want to execute in the device and along with the kernel some rules on how we want the data of the buffer to be accessed inside the kernel so this uh, this thing is encapsulated in something called as a command group now how do we access this encapsulated material that is with the help of a command group handler this is how we have created a command group handler so after creating a command group handler what we need to do is we need to create an accessor this is how we create an accessor what is an accessor accessor is actually providing uh, the rules as i was mentioning on how you can access the buffer so you can see here we have mentioned we can access the buffer in read write mode like that means you can read read from the buffer and you can write to the buffer as well okay uh, then the next step is uh, this uh, this uh, is actually executing the kernel so uh, you need to mention again this is another property of the handler itself you need to mention how do you want to execute the kernel whether you want to execute it parallelly or you want to execute it serially here we have mentioned parallel for that means we want my our kernel to be executed parallelly if you want your kernel to be executed serially you can mention single task in place of parallel for here now what do we need to pass inside this we need to pass the range again and then we need to pass an iterator like we used to do in our traditional c++ pro programming we used to create uh, an iterator inside the for loop right so here we are creating an iterator uh, this is an id class and to access uh, the elements inside the accessor we need to use something uh, from the id class and that mean uh, the, the object of that id class is i here so we are accessing the entire uh, like all the elements using this iterator so what we are doing here we are just incrementing each elements of this uh, by one and then uh, this this is the operation that we are doing so now i i told you i i'll let you know why this is and uh, this parenthesis was necessary so what this parenthesis does is it will copy back the data from on um, whatever you are uh, like the whatever operations you did in device uh, this updated results will be copied back to the host uh, soon after you have uh, uh, like applied this uh, closing parenthesis so this means the buffer is destructed so before the buffer is destructed it will copy back all the data to the host and this is as you know just printing out the data available in the host and then freeing the data so this is in short the traditional way of how you write a sql code as you can see there are many new new syntaxes and many new uh, like methodologies that needs to be done uh, to make the code available across hardware and like across uh, our uh, host and device. So let's see how SQL 2020 has simplified that. To know that uh, uh, we have a couple of features uh, or, or an extensions of SQL that are already a part of SQL 2020. As I already mentioned, we will be going through USM subgroups and reductions. But if you want to go through many of the other extensions that are there, each one has a link here and the slides will be shared to you shortly. And you also have a URL here which will take you directly to the SQL 2020 specifications. And there also you can see uh, all, this, uh, all the simplifications that has been done to SQL 2020. Okay, with that in mind, we will just see how SQL 2020 has reduced the verbosity of the language. So this was a traditional way of writing the code, as I already showed you, right? And this, as you see below, is how it's written currently in SQL 2020. So buffer creation, well, earlier we had to mention the range, 
then we needed to mention what data type, what dimension, everything, right? Now nothing is needed. You mentioned the buffer, then you mentioned the object of the buffer, and you just pass the data that you want to be put inside the buffer. That's it. Your buffer will be created. Next step. Next step is how you create an accessor. So you, you remember how we used to create an accessor earlier. We used to specify the access mode uh, as read, read, write, and then used to use this get, get access method. Now nothing. You can just pass this accessor, and inside this, you need to pass the buffer that you want to create accessor of, and then the handler. That's it. So this, by default, uh, will create an accessor in the read, write mode. But if you want any other modes uh, for the accessor, then please feel free to mention that at the end. With that, uh, we we saw how this. Okay, again, uh, again, the iterator. Also, you need do, do not need to men mention this ID class and create an uh, iterator directly. You can mention auto and die, and it will create an iterator for you. For you. So uh, you can see how even the buffer uh, buffered approach has been simplified in SQL 2020. So uh, with with the coming time, each and every thing that's available in SQL is getting more and more simplified um, with with the inputs of the community. Okay, so let's move on to another approach of writing the code that is known as USM. So what is USM? USM is a pointer-based approach uh, of SQL to write the code. So why USM uh, has come up? Uh, well, there was already a buffered approach to SQL uh, for like SQL code coding. So uh, there are many C++ developers who want to take the advantage of, uh, uh, of SQL, right? And want to run their code on heterogeneous platform. But for them, uh, uh, like coding their application using a buffered approach may be difficult, uh, mainly because uh, this this buffer, like every line of allocation of memory needs to be changed using buffered approach because everything needs to be put inside a buffer, right? Whereas earlier we used to write our code with the help of pointers. That was the inspiration why uh, we came up with this USM approach of code approach of the of writing code again and the second thing is uh, some developers want to have a uh, control of how the data is uh, traveling in between the host and the device so uh, we don't have that uh, that level of flexibility in buffer but with usm uh, we will uh, see how how but we have that flexibility of man like explicitly copying the data to and fro um, the device and host Okay, so this is uh, this is a way in which uh, like if we don't explicitly copy uh, like we are, if we are not explicitly copying the memory uh, from the host to the device, this is how uh, we can also declare uh, a memory in case of USM. So if we declare a mem we can all, all, we can declare the shared memory in USM that can be accessible across the CPU and GPU. That means we. We don't need to do a main copy. So there are two ways of writing an USM code. One is the explicit method in which we explicitly copy the data, and one is the uh, another uh, method that implicit, where we don't need to copy the data explicitly. Everything is done on its own. So there are three ways of writing USM code, mainly uh, depending on the memory allocation. First is the malloc device. What happens in the malloc device is uh, it creates, uh, like we need to allocate memory in the host and we need to allocate memory in the device using malloc device. And then the transfer is explicit, right? We need uh, we need to use mem copy to copy the memory to and fro the host and the device. Next is the malloc host in which uh, the, the memory is allocated in the host, but you don't need to, uh, worry about copying to and fro it's it's done implicitly again in malloc shared this is the most popular way of writing the code for beginners where you don't need to uh, explicitly copy to and fro the code but uh, if you allocate the memory using malloc shared you can access that memory in host as well as in device so this is one one example of malloc device and malloc shared 
So it's uh, as as you as I already mentioned, you need to create uh, like uh, some memory with malloc device. And here we are create uh, creating memory. We have already allocated this data in host. So what we what I will do now is we will copy using name copy uh, whatever was present in data to data data device right uh, like this is the traditional mem copy syntax that we are being used here and uh, then we do the parallel for as we did for buffer also and then after this operation is done again we are copying back the data from data device to data so that's what uh, happens when we explicitly do the transfer why this is necessary because some developers want to have control on this data transfer and for them this is extremely important so this is the implicit way and the most easy way for c++ developers who are trying to port their code to sql and get the benefit of running the coding heterogeneous platform so what happens uh, using malloc shared is you just allocate the data using malloc shared and uh, then then you can access that data from the device as well as from the host. So you can see here we have not done any mem copy, but we are able to do the operations inside the uh, device as well. And if you print the results, you will see this uh, this modifications to this da data has already has been done and it's getting printed. So the copy back and forth has been done implicitly. We don't need to worry about that. Okay. With that in mind, we will go to uh, the first hands-on coding that is on USM concept. We will have one one hands-on and implicit and explicit data management. Okay, so I think most of you have already logged in to DevCloud. Uh, if not, can you can I get a, a like raise of hand, please? How many of you have already logged into DevCloud? Attendees, please raise hands if you have already logged into Intel DevCloud accounts so that we could get a rough idea of how many people are yet to do it. Okay. Uh, I see a lot of people have already logged into DevCloud for uh, other people. Uh, please go to this link. I think it's posted in uh, the chat and the discord channel as well and uh, after uh, you go to this link you will get uh, a page where you need to enter your uh, information like your first name last name email id username so after that uh, you can uh, go ahead and you will uh, you can go to the next step and you will actually get an email uh, with the login and email address in in the email account that you have mentioned there so uh, all of uh, are all of us aligned in this like uh, please please uh, click on the link and go to that page fill in your information here and get the mail this login id is required for us to log into our dev cloud and do the hands-on exercises I'll give a minute. If you have any difficulties, feel free to uh, reach out uh, to us. So after you get the mail, we need to uh, go to this uh, one API getting started. This you will have a link to log into the cloud there itself in the mail. So click there. Let me go to my screen. After you go go to that link, there will be an option to launch your server. Let me stop the presentation and show you. So you'll get a page like this. Is my Google screen visible? Uh, 
But one I can see my presentation is on the presentation. You can see it. But it's telling I'm sharing my entire screen. Okay, let me try again. Okay, yep. I think now it will be good. It's visible now, right, Kavita? Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, thanks. So uh, after you have the login ID and login to the to your desktop account. You will see a page like this. So you need to scroll down here to this launch Jupyter Lab. Okay, I think I have given some time. After you click on launch Jupyter Lab, it will give you an option to launch the server. Click on that. And then, uh, like those of you who had uh, already explored the dev cloud and written some code, made some folders, those will come here. So basically, all the directory structures will come here. So, uh, what we will be interested in is uh, the one API essentials. So, you will see here. Intel One API Essentials. Let me see where it is for me. One API essentials, please click there. And you can uh, scroll down to a uh, welcome IPYNB. This is a Jupyter notebook, and we'll be following this. So, we have several modules uh, for the beginners as well as for the advanced user. We will go uh, to unified shared memory uh, now, and we will do the lab exercise here. Uh, just for people who have who had already logged in earlier uh, to the desk cloud, uh, and uh, you you have an you may have an older uh, version of the materials present. In that case, all you need to do is go to module zero. And then you will have a refresh option inside this module. So if you go down, you will have something to refresh. One second, I'll show you. Yep, you need to click here. So your entire uh, like lab materials will be refreshed and updated. This is only for people who have uh, logged in long back. Uh, for recent users, you will already get the latest material available uh, in your system. So we'll go to module three for USM lab. I hope I have given enough time for everyone. So first, we will see uh, the implicit way of data movement that is through malloc shared, as I mentioned, right? So you can see here malloc shared. First, I will uh, run the code. Uh, like uh, save, you need to save the code first. All you need to do is click anywhere uh, in this box and do Control Enter. Come down. Build in the build and run section again. Do Control Enter. This will build and run your code, and the first one will save your code. For the, the control enter in the first block. So let the code run. By that time, I will just quickly go through the code. So I think I have already mentioned most of the steps in uh, in the sample that I showed. So here, uh, one one thing that needs to be understood here is, uh, like I, there is a see out statement here. What it's printing is uh, the device where your code is running. So usually we use this method, uh, like uh, the queue has a method known as get device, and from that we are trying to print the information of that device, the device name we are printing. So you will see after after we have run the code, it prints the device as well. 
so yeah this is what we have got so here what we had done inside the kernel is we had just multiplied all the data into two and what was our data uh, like starting from zero uh, till 15 right in in 16 so less than 16 so 0 to 15 was our data so everything will be multiplied by 2 so you can see the correct results are here and you can see that it's running in Intel graphics card now uh, this is uh, the explicit way of running the code as uh, you can see we need to save this same thing we have uh, like allocated uh, the data here in the host and then data device in the device and then we have used mem copy to copy to the device run the kernel same thing into two all the data and then copy back uh, to the host and then printed uh, all the values in the host so we should get a similar output here as well just to control enter it will take a few seconds and we'll just fill out Just the uh, hand raised on how many people were able to follow. Okay. So a quick help from the organization or organizers. Can you give uh, me a uh, like idea on how many people are following with the hands on? But I can see uh, quite a few. Yeah. Okay. So should I move or should I give some time? Can we give them a couple of time, a uh, couple of minutes, Subarna, and we should. Uh... Sure. Good, thanks. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll give them some time. Yeah. Okay, so let me summarize now what USM was, the concept. So uh, USM basically, as I mentioned, is a pointer-based approach of writing code in SQL. And uh, we also saw the implicit and explicit way of writing code using USM. Okay, I'm going ahead now. I hope all of you were able to follow up because we need to cover this material and you can always do the hands-on session later and come back to us as long as you are clear with the concepts. Okay, so our next topic is subgroups. For explaining what the subgroups are, I, I would like to take some time in explaining the SQL thread hierarchy and mapping. So how in SQL program, uh, like the entire uh, chunk of data is considered and how it's broken into smaller pieces so, so as to make a data parallelism more efficient or parallel execution more efficient. So here uh, we can see a large block this block is the entire chunk of data that we have. We call it ND range. As you can see here, it's three dimensional. It can be one, two, or three dimensional. Three dimension is the maximum supported dimension of uh, from SQL. So inside each, inside this ND range, you can uh, break uh, this entire data into small or in, entire executions. You may say all the executions into small chunks. And these are known as work groups. Again, work groups are also the, of the same dimension as the ND range. So here, both are three dimensional, you can see. So this orange part is the work group. Each work group can further, okay, before, before telling that, each work group has its own local memory. 
uh, and uh, like th these work groups can execute independently and all uh, the small units inside the work group can interact with each other uh, through the local memory that they have and uh, but the items in the work group cannot interact with the items of uh, the next work group so this is the constraint in the work group so work groups can further be divided into subgroup this is the concept which we will be focusing now this green color part as you can see so the subgroups are always of one dimension and uh, it has again uh, a number of items and these items can interact with each other directly and not with the, they don't need a memory or a local memory to interact and uh, they take the maximum advantage of hardware as well how we will see in the next slides before explaining how the subgroups takes advantage of the hardware let us uh, let me explain how intel uh, gen 9 graphics processor looks like so this is a rough over like uh, a very high level diagram of how gen 11 graphics uh, processor looks like in intel so this is the uh, we have uh, eight sub slices in the graphics uh, in the graphics card and uh, each sub slice each sub slices has eight views so user execution units and each sub, uh, each sub slice uh, are uh, units that can execute independently and the use are the units where the execution goes on so we can see like since all of them can execute independently and they have their own local memory that is the slm so this can be ma mapped to the work group as i showed earlier in the diagram and now each eu has a, a in the thread right so that's the actual place uh, where this uh, execution goes on and this uh, cmd lens can be mapped to a subgroup so those of you who will be well acquired with cpu program acquainted with cpu programming will be aware of what cmd and cmd lens are right so uh, this uh, inside each u we have cmd len or channel and each uh, subgroup is mapped to a cmd len Okay, with that in mind, uh, let's understand what are the operations that uh, subgroups uh, support. Why it is important is we don't need to access the memory every time, and so these operations are quicker. And uh, some of uh, examples of these operations are the uh, shuffle operations, we will, which examples we will see in the next slides. And another uh, set of operations is the sub subgroup collective. These are certain kinds of pre-built functions that we can use those are op very much optimized and it gives us maximum performance okay so this is how we get a handle of subgroup so uh, first thing is uh, the program or the uh, hands-on we did then we didn't mention anything inside parallel for and we let the compiler decide on its own how they uh, how it wants to execute the entire chunk of data right but here what we are doing is each execution unit how it will execute we are explicitly mentioning how we can do that we can explicitly mention the work group size right so uh, if we are explicitly mentioning the work group size how much work group size we uh, want uh, like from like how the engine should be divided uh, that control if the developer wants to have then they can pass this ND range and within that this is n is the global size or the size of the ND range in the diagram that I showed you before. In this diagram, this entire size is the ND range and this size is the work group size or the local memory size. And this is lo lo not the local memory size, but the local uh, local uh, size of the this is the size of the work group basically, and this is the ND range size. So these two are the parameters we can pass here. And what we are doing here is we are uh, trying to get a handle of the subgroup so that we can operate on the subgroup here. Uh, so here subgroup is predefined. What we are doing is we are getting a handle and trying to run the operations there. So as I mentioned, we have three, two operations or two major operations that we'll discuss here, but there are several other operations as well. This is a shuffle operation and uh, there are uh, several shuffle operations also so we as you can see we can do select from group we can do, um, do shift groups left shift 
shift group right or permute uh, group by XOR. So let's take an example. So uh, like select from group will only select some data and they don't need to uh, like approach the memory. They can do it directly. Again, shift group left will uh, shift one one data towards the left, right will shift one data towards the right. And XOR will do XOR operations in between these consecutive blocks of inside the subgroup. So it, uh, again, as I mentioned, it's faster since it doesn't need to access the local memory. Another important uh, feature of the subgroup uh, is, uh, is the use of reduce. So we will go through reduction in details later again. But uh, subgroup has a feature uh, which it can use. And it has, uh, as I mentioned about the collectives uh, or the algorithms before. So it has some algorithms predefined and we can directly call this algorithm. So what is happening is inside reduce, we are calling something called plus. What it will do is it will add all the elements available inside inside that particular subgroup, right? So uh, so what what happens is uh, the reduction also is taken care of, uh, and, and this optimized uh, function is also taking care of the operations that are that are happening inside the subgroup. So we can do a max choosing a maximum element. We can also do choosing a minimum element, and so on. So again, one more thing we can do with subgroup is uh, we can explicitly define uh, the size of the subgroup. Again, the developers who wants to go deep and explore on uh, like uh, defining the subgroup on their own, they can use this Intel extension of uh, uh, this required subgroup size and pass the subgroup size explicitly. So if you are passing 16 explicitly means you can be well aware that the size of your subgroup will be 16. So make sure this is a supported uh, sub, uh, subgroup size. All this information also you can um, get from CL in, by running CL info in your code. So yeah. So now let's uh, move on to the hands-on of subgroups. Okay, so subgroups is module four. Let's go to module four. Uh, this this first few uh, hands-on exercises. So uh, one thing is inside the Jupyter notebook. Also, if you want to refresh your concepts before doing the lab, we have a brief description of all the concepts here also. And uh, the first few subgroup exercises is only uh, like pointing out the subgroup size and like with the handle we can do several operations right? like finding uh, the size of the subgroup group and finding each ID of the subgroup and so on. So those uh, small, small examples are here. You can go through all the examples. But uh, here, what I'll be doing is I will help you uh, run uh, run either a shuffle or a collective operation so that you can understand how that works. OK, so this is subgroup shuffle. So let's run this. So as you can see here, we are doing a permute uh, group by XR, right? So as I already mentioned there, we don't need to do much except just calling uh, this permute by XR here. And it will uh, do the permutation between, uh, like it will do the XR operation between uh, consequent units. So let's save this with control enter and compile and run this with control enter. As it runs, let's quickly go through this. Uh, what, what it's doing is, uh, what are the data we have here? So uh, this is the global workgroup size. That is the entire indeed end size. And this is the local workgroup size. And uh, OK, we are passing the data from 0 to 255 here. So let's see how the permutation goes on. While this is executing, we can also see the next example. 
so this is a, a reduction example so if you want you can run this also so once you have an access to dev cloud you can uh, run all these examples and uh, actually modify them accordingly some already has some modifications which uh, like uh, you need to do from your side in the exercises and uh, it will help you understand how to code uh, well and uh, like even understanding in and out of uh, the operations that are happening So okay, so one uh, one thing I missed to, to uh, let you know is there is another parameter that is passed inside Permute uh, by XR uh, that is like uh, if suppose this is one month uh, every next thing uh, like every next element uh, will it it will do an XR with the every, every next element right so if this is increased so the XR operation uh, will uh, like if this is four it will happen between first and fourth element. Uh, the XR operation and with the second it will happen with the fifth element so so on so yeah so here uh, because here uh, we had passed this uh, get max local range minus one so uh, what is happening is it's, it's doing for every 16 elements uh, since 16 was, uh, if you don't mention any subgroup size, so 16 will be your uh, subgroup size. So uh, between every 16 elements, it's doing the shuffle operation. Okay, uh, with that, let's quickly uh, cover the reduction concept. Uh, so, one second. Okay, so uh, you must be aware of the concept of reduction. So reduction is usually uh, uh, like operating on the same value and storing, operating on a value and storing uh, the value in the original variable itself. So that is called reduction. So when you are parallelizing reduction, it can be tricky because we need to ensure that every parallel units are synchronized at the end of the reduction operation, right? So for that, SQL has come up with a very easy way. So just imagine, like we uh, like we saw earlier, we have a reduction uh, method in subgroup. We have a similar reduction method in workgroup as well, but if you apply this reduction method in uh, in the subgroup or workgroup level again you need to worry about synchronizing this individual subgroup and workgroup for that uh, there is a simplified reduction that is available and you can pass this reduction method in the parallel for itself so what, what we are doing here is we are passing this reduction method in parallel for itself and uh, we are passing the sum that we have allo allocated using malloc shared here and uh, then we are passing this plus method we saw right we have plus maximum minimum and so on so uh, we don't need to worry anything about the reduction and uh, this sum plus equals to data i that is it's increasing the sum by uh, the individual items of this data array and it's adding to this original sum right this is a reduction happening here and this all the synchronizations required will automatically be handled by the compiler itself you don't need to worry about it this is an extension of sql specification itself uh, sql 2020 specification itself this reduction on the parallel for a level that you don't need to worry anything about the correctness here so one more thing about reduction that I would like to introduce is, suppose there you are doing only one operation, that is uh, the plus operation, right? So you can have multiple operation together in the same parallel for. So you can see here we have plus maximum both. So we have created one one objects for both of them and we have passed those in the parallel for itself. So what will happen is it will calculate the sum as well as it will calculate the maximum uh, value uh, like uh, from the array it will calculate what is the maximum value from from the not the array here it may be an array but it can be anything so that's another possibility so uh, one quick check kavita should we go ahead with the hands on or uh, for this reduction because we are already at the top of the hour uh, like uh, if if you want we can tell the user to do this on their own or if we have some time i can quickly go through the reduction operation like hands on as well
We're good. Can't hear you. Uh, we can go there. Right? I can go ahead, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. So okay. Uh, this go. Please go to the reduction. That is. Uh, okay. Let's go to the reduction module. That is module eight. Okay, now uh, le let's let's directly go. Like we have first the reduction uh, on, on at the work group level, then the reduction at the subgroup level. Uh, so uh, here, uh, let's go directly to the reduction that I reduction example that I showed you. That is the reduction that we can directly apply to the parallel for. Just save this. So as it's running, let's quickly go through the code also. So we have defined uh, data using malloc shared here. Uh, we have initialized the data. Again, we have created another, uh, like we have another create again created another variable with malloc shared here uh, that will store the sum. Inside the parallel for we have uh, just passed this reduction method and uh, we have passed this sum that we have already created and we are doing the we are calling the plus here because we are uh, calculating the sum and then as as you already know this traditional way of writing the code we have passed the nd item uh, and uh, mentioned an iterator here it's one dimensional so uh, it's 1d and then uh, we have defined uh, an a variable named temp that will actually combine the data here at the end. Okay, so you can see it has calculated this code successfully. So what what it has done is uh, like it has taken each and every element and added the sum here, as you can see here. So uh, yeah, you don't need to take care of anything. It has done the reduction operation on its own. Okay, uh, so uh, let's run. If we have time, we'll run one more reduction operation as well then. So you can uh, go through this, uh, like this are different approaches, like that was the USM approach, this is the buffered approach and everything uh, with all this, we are like learning how to use the reduction. This is the exact same syntax that I showed you in the presentation as well. We are just passing this plus minimum maximum inside this auto reduction sum itself. This is why we are creating accessor itself, we are passing this. And then in the a parallel for, uh, we are passing this accessor itself right and that the before this was the usm method of uh, like handling reduction there we what we were doing is we are creating an accessor and uh, and here we are creating another object named temp and we are combining everything at the end here but here but here what we are doing is uh, like first uh, we, we have three individual operations that are happening and we are combining each of them at the end so like uh, maybe if you are going through all of these in uh, like minor details, you will understand more and then maybe like you can come back to us and we can discuss more. So you can see it has given all the three results. So it has started, the element started from zero. So the minimum is obviously zero. So it's, it was less than one zero two, it was zero to one zero two three, right? All the elements. So the maximum element will be one zero two three. That's what it has shown. And all the addition from 0 to 1, 0, 2, 3 is 5, 2, 3, 7, 7, 6, as we saw in the earlier also. 
So mm, the reduction was handled like this and we didn't have to worry about it. Okay, so did that let summarize what we learned in reduction? Uh, we learned how we can parallelize the reduction. Like uh, we don't need uh, to do, uh, like we can do either reduction in, uh, like we can use the reduction method in subgroup level, workgroup level, or we can directly pass the reduction method as an argument in the parallel for itself. Uh, so we don't need to worry about the synchronization. Okay, with uh, that, I will give a few minutes uh, uh, for the audience to complete the exercise and then we will uh, go to the polls and then we will take over the Q&A session. Uh, so, uh, Okay, any, like, uh, did you follow the lab exercises? Bernard, there are a few questions on this call. Uh, maybe if you... Okay. Yeah, wanna... like, uh, yeah, I can take it up now maybe and then uh, take the poll question and then summarize. Yeah, that, that will be fine. Let's take the Q&A now. So, Kavita, should I go to the Discord and answer the questions? Or you want me to answer here itself? Yeah, I think we can open up for questions now so people can start uh, posting in their questions on Discord or on the Q&A window here. And maybe we'll give them a few minutes, Sabana, to address any questions. Yep, but sure. that's, um, So I think Ashwini, Ashwin is uh, trying to set up the kernel. Uh, so there was a question from, from him and okay. I think Nikita is trying to address it there on Discord. But yeah, I mean, overall, if there are any questions for Subana, please uh, post it on Discord or on the question section. And, here. and even like any questions on the hands-on part, like do you want me to go through any of the hands-on again? Uh, so Subana, I think there's a question uh, here in go to chat window mm -hmm. for you. Okay. Uh, most of them are about just the link not being accessible, but I was able to see one question, which is how is one API different than OpenCL? Okay, well, one thing that. is uh, if, if you are aware of OpenCL way of writing the code and you saw the code that I show, I have shown you, OpenCL is a more far, far, far more verbose way of writing the code. You need to write each and every line of code of what is happening and nothing is actually encapsulated. You need to mention everything. And you have separate files for uh, like the device portion of the code and the host portion of the code. Uh, as you already saw, SQL is a more easier way of writing the code uh, in the sense it's less verbose and it's uh, more developer friendly. So you don't need to mention each and every operation. So everything is encapsulated. The encapsulation is also increasing day by day and it's becoming lesser verbose in SQL also. But uh, even compared uh, as compared to OpenCell, it's far, far more easier to handle. That's what I would tell. And one more question is, what link were they not able to access, Anushka? I think the DevCloud setup link was uh, not accessible to them. Uh, so a few people are were facing problem with the SSH keys, and some of them were simply not able to access the link that we shared in the chat window. I wonder why that was happening. But I think people then uh, just uh, continue to follow with what you were saying. So maybe next time we can uh, take this suggestion that, you know, we can kind okay. of uh, do the setup part in advance so that there's a lot, uh, there's a lesser, you know, problem with the setup part during the workshop. Session. I, 
Okay, sure. I think I saw a question of repeating the uh, USM implicit and explicit uh, portions. Uh, so let me uh, do that hands on, like let me rerun that hands on one once. So, sure. yep. Let's go to module three here. Okay, so this is the malloc shared or the implicit way of copying data from device to host. So we are running here. So if any questions on this hands on, please feel free to ask me. Uh, what we are doing here is allocating um, uh, like data using malloc shared and this is ac accessible across the host and device. So nothing else we need to do. We are just initializing the array and uh, like just submitting the kernel where we are multiplying each element of the array into two. And we are using weight by the way to uh, do the synchronization because as you see, this is reduction operation again. And uh, then I'm printing the output. So yeah, I ran it already and you can see what, what was our data is zero to 15 and every element has been uh, multiplied by two. Okay, and then uh, moving on, let's see how malloc device or the explicit way of data transfer works. So here, we, what we have done is we have created data using uh, using normal malloc as we do. Then we have created uh, like we have created allocated some memory using malloc device. So this this memory will be accessible from the device. Now I have initialized the data of the host and what I am doing using memcopy is copy all data from the host that is from data to data device, right? This is the traditional way of memcopy that we use in C++ as well. After that, what we are doing is uh, we are doing q dot parallel for and uh, then uh, we are just running the kernel as we did in the previous case also every element we are just multiplying by two and then we are copying back all the results from the device to the host using again the mem copy and at the end we are just printing the results in the host so this is the explicit way and uh, yeah same answers we will get so 0 to 15 every element has been multiplied by two Okay, so should I go to the Q and A for questions? Like, uh, how do you want me to take up the questions? Okay, Mr. Or do you want me? Uh, okay, you are not all. Hello. No. Yep. Uh, yes, yeah, so okay, yes, Mr. There's one mm -hmm. question on Discord. Please repeat explicit yep. versus implicit USM demo. Yeah, that's what I did just now. And uh, I think there's one more. How can we debug or profile one API programs? Um, profile one API program. What do you mean by profiled one API program? Like you are running VTune for profiling and then you want to debug it like Josna mentioned. So, well, if you are actually profiling with the help of any profiling tool available as a part of one API, you will get hints like you, you, you will get hints from that tool itself on what or what all you need to do. And going deep in that is a like a separate session itself. But you have uh, our uh, getting started with VTune and VTune cookbook. If you search in Google, you will find all of them and those will help you understand the information that uh, that you got from uh, this profiling tools of Intel. I hope that's what you asked. If not, please, uh, please explain what what your question was. Perhaps he means by checking bottlenecks for performance optimization. 
yeah that's what will be available in v2 and that's what i told you uh, like how you will resolve those will also be a part of the cookbook and it will explain how, how what all you need to do okay moving so, so next i'll, I'll meet in a little bit uh, kavita i can give little sure. more details on that so as i mentioned in the one api base toolkit we also have a performance analysis tool which is part of it and as Subana mentioned, this is a called VTune. So you can run your one API application VTune, and VTune has a capability of running different kind of uh, uh, reports for you. So you can do a hotspot analysis. Where is the bottleneck in your code? You want to understand, or you also have any issues with your memory or threading issues. So you can run different kind of analysis, even the performance bottleneck on GPU side. Or if you would like to understand, if I want to port this code on the GPU what kind of performance would i get so all this information you can get it from the tools which are available on the one api base toolkit vtune is one performance analysis tool another one is called advisor which allows you to understand the performance implication if you would like to port it on gpu so what kind of performance you will get which part of the code you would like to port it to the gpu or any other accelerator device so these kind of information are available um, we can put the links to these uh, toolkits on the chat window and also the training content and the documentation associated with it so uh, you can uh, you can go through with that and probably if you come across some problem we also have a community forum where you can raise your question or post your question later point of time once you use all these tools and if you face any challenges yeah this is what i want to add and kavita please go ahead yeah so thanks uh justin so one of there's a couple of more questions on the chat yeah sure um, so there is um sure. Chat, this chat is it? Should I go and access it or? Yeah, I can already call it out. Okay, yeah. Other yeah, sure. Discord. Or... No, it's on the chat window on the go to webinar. So I think uh, there's one question from Karthik. Does one API mm -hmm. provide the encapsulation in any other language other than C plus plus? Uh, this is not about one API, right? One API is a test suit. Like uh, you have several tools as a part of one API. It's the name of the language is SQL, and SQL is best out of uh, C++ only. So yeah, it's it can be any other language. It's C++ only in which uh, which which forms the basis of SQL. Sure, thanks. There's one question from Ramakrishna. How do we handle the stream of numbers are to be processed using are they to be processed using SQL? I think I would need more clarification on this question. I am not sure what did you mean by stream of number? Okay, and let me... where you want them to be processed? Yeah, maybe if he can provide a bit clarification on this question, it will be easier for me to answer that. Sure. The other question is from Karthik, uh, and his question is, can we get the block memory allocation in the toolkit itself, like how it is in the uh, Visual Studio? Which allocation? Can we get the block memory allocation within the toolkit itself? Again, I am not sure I understood it. Block memory allocation, the toolkit itself means again, it's a pie. I would tell it's a part of. Uh, I am not sure whether you have people have understood the difference between one API and SQL. One API is a test suite where we have uh, several uh, several tools like compilers, uh, and uh, then we have analyzer tool where we are profiling tools like we do and we have other tools like advisor inspector and so on uh, even for uh, like um, this data mining and all we have several tools like uh, dnn and so on but uh, sql is a language and uh, we create workgroups as a part of this language itself uh, I am not sure what did you mean by creating blocks as a part of Visual Studio. Uh, maybe again, I would need clarification in this question as well. Uh, 
So any other questions? So people uh, whose question I'm not, I didn't answer or I was not understanding the question, please feel free to uh, re-ask those questions. You can ask it again with more in, with a bit more information, help me understand what the question is, and I'll surely reply to your question. I think alternately, uh, you know, so Barna, somebody is asking about how do you set up that Jupiter lab? Probably you want to show it one more time. How okay, do you open sure. the Jupiter lab on the dev cloud? Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. I can show it one more time. So uh, yeah, okay. Let me start again. So uh, what you need to do is you need to go to the URL devcloud.intel.com slash one API. And then after you have logged in, I am already logged in here, so it didn't ask me for credential. You need to put your credential. That's the ID that you got in mail and log in here and then go to get started here. I'll go slow so that you, uh, all of you can get how you access this. Click on get started. Scroll to the extreme end of this page. Here you will see connect with Jupyter Lab. And you need to do a launch Jupyter Lab. That will help you go come to this page. Okay, from here, all you need to, uh, like on the left hand side, you need to go to One API Essentials. Okay, and here you will get all the modules. So if you want to see all the modules in the same Jupyter Notebook, just click on welcome.ipynb and you will see all the modules here. So Joseph, for all those people who had query about it, is it resolved or uh, do they need any more expression or they are stuck in any particular step, we can help them out then. Yeah, I'm just trying to see in the Discord channel now. Sure, sure. So why not? Okay, sure, yeah. Uh, so when I don't know how relevant it is at this point of time, but there was a question uh, put across mm -hmm. uh, long back. You know, mm -hmm. they were requesting for, uh, you know, can you please show us once how to set up one API in Jupyter Lab? So okay. if you have a like, few minutes, maybe you can, uh, do you want to run it back? and uh, show them once yeah, uh, like this is the same thing i just showed now again right or something else oh like you mean each an individual program or do they maybe mean just individual? Couple of on jupyter lab uh this was put across long time back i guess um sorry if we couldn't address it on time but uh or else this recording is good enough i mean they can just go through the recording once again yeah, and if you want to know how to address, like how to run and compile the individual program, maybe you can go to uh, this modules and just to do a control enter in the blocks. But before you press control enter, make sure you understand what's there in the blocks. Uh, and uh, for that, we have a small summary of all the concepts in each module before you start doing the coding. And again, one more thing is uh, once you deep dive into the coding or into the lab sessions towards the end, you will find some examples or some codes that needs your input and it will tell, okay, put your code here. So make sure you are putting your code there and like you are writing your code there before you actually run the program. Just don't blindly save and run the program. But if you want to run, all you need to do is click on the block and do control enter that will first First in the code module, it will save your code, and then in the build and run module, it will build your code and run your code. So I hope that was clear, but again, I'm telling if something is not clear, please feel free to post questions and uh, we'll all, always try to help you out. And it's just a starting, right? It's just uh, what I explained in the concepts feel free to go through this like whenever you get time experiment with whatever you want 
and we are always there to help you out if you are getting stuck anywhere. Okay, maybe it should we go ahead with the poll questions now, Kavita? Or do we have any other questions? So, um, so Barna, I read one question yeah. here. Uh, do we have any control over parallel for? It's kind of a, a black box for now, uh, but do we have any means to tweak it? Uh, what do you mean by control over parallel for like how the parallelism is getting handled there? Do you mean that or, or do you mean you don't want to run it parallelly? You want to do it some, some other way. So this is just a syntax. Parallel for is just a syntax. Like we have like even for OpenMP is another style of writing the C++ code parallelly, right? There also we have some flaws which we need to mention uh, in the, some target flaws. Uh, so like similarly, this is the syntax for making the compiler understand that we want to run this parallelly. So if you, even if you want to run a serial, you can mention single task. And we have, in fact, one more which tells parallel, uh, parallel for indie range. There, there we have more specifications where it actually takes care of uh, the individual elements of indie range as well. So, uh, like, uh, what what do you mean? Uh, like, what what more do you want here? It's just a syntax uh, for making the compiler understand that you want in that you want the code to be run parallel. That's it. Okay, I see another question. How SQL is different from LibOka? So I think LibOka is a library, right? And SQL is a language. So I am not sure how they can be same. We have several libraries that can be used in SQL language also. So I am not sure how can they can be the same. They are different to the very core because one is a language and another is a library. Yeah, very rightly pointed out. Uh, Subarna, so Oka is also as a kind of a framework or a library which allows you to have a heterogeneity in place, but underneath you need to have implementation. And Oka is also enabled with uh, our DPC or SQL as a backend uh, at this point of time, and people can use it one API through Oka as well. Thanks, uh, Jasna, for helping me on that. So, again, asking any other questions? Yeah, we are, we are going through questions, but now we'll let you know. Okay. So, should we start the polls now uh, in the time in which you can summarize the questions, maybe from the Discord? So, there is another question is how okay. one API stands in front of CUDA of NVIDIA. CUDA already has all the features showcased today, like USM subgroup and many more advanced feature. So, to answer this question, why one API is there? The purpose is different. What we want to do is we want to democratize the heterogeneous computing and remove the vendor locking and have a unified programming model to, to work on CPU, GPU, and, uh, and FPGA or any other accelerator. If you talk about CUDA and NVIDIA, it's very proprietary. And CUDA is only language to access GPU, uh, which is uh, uh, delivered from NVIDIA. And it cannot target to any other architecture. So this is how one API is different. It allows you to, to work on heterogeneous platform seamlessly, whether you would like to target your application for CPU, GPU, FPGA, or any other uh, uh, accelerator. Thanks, Josh. I think we have one more question to repeat the concept of reduction. So uh, let me go through that once again. Uh, 
okay so uh, to start with what is reduction right you want to understand what is reduction in the first place so uh, reduction is uh, is a method in which we calculate uh, uh, it, it produces a single value by combining multiple values it means we are calculating something and storing the results in the initial value itself like i already showed right ai uh, plus one uh, equals to plus one right so it's adding one one value to the uh, array and storing it in the array itself so that kind of thing is uh, known as reduction so why reduction is important in case of parallel programming is reduction produces uh, reduction can produce errors while coding in parallel the reason being there are separate a separate parallel units right or there are separate separate units in which the program is getting run parallelly so we need to have a, syn a synchronization in place at the end so that uh, so that we get the correct answers at the end right so that's where in parallel programming reduction is very very important so how tickle 2020 deals with reduction so as I already mentioned, the subgroup subgroup has a function called reduction. So sub subgroup class has its own reduction function. Similarly, workgroup also has its own reduction function. Now, what is the issue there is if you have a separate function for uh, subgroups at the end of like suppose all the subgroups are synchronized. Now you need to have a process in place to synchronize the individual subgroups as well towards the end, right? Same for workgroup. All the workgroups are uh, now synchronized. So at the end, you need to get the correct result out of all the subgroups together, right? For that, again, you need to run the code serially across the sub all the workgroups. But if we have a simplified reduction, which maintains, uh, like, again, this is a kind of encapsulation. And so what it's doing inside is it's taking care of all the synchronization that are required as a part of this reduction operation. So what we are doing, this is a very simple example or code snippet, as you can see. Um, I have just allocated two memories here. Like one is data and one is sum. What, what is our uh, kernel doing? It's adding the individual items from the data array and storing it in the sum variable. This that's it. That's what it's doing. That's it. The kernel is doing this. But if you don't uh, like keep uh, attend give attention to the synchronization what will happen is it will give you incorrect result in the end for that we have this simple procedure what we are doing is we are passing this reduction method in the parallel for itself this is a feature of sql 2020 and uh, plus what what happens is uh, this is an addition operation so we need to do the uh, all the synchronizations required uh, and this is a plus operation so we are passing this plus here so these these are inbuilt methods. So we are uh, passing uh, the variable where the values will be stored, and what is the operation that's going on? That's a plus operation that's going on, right? So we are passing that also. So this is how this is what is the simplified reduction means. So we don't need to handle uh, the reduction like uh, we are handling reduction in subgroup or group level, right? But here in SQL 2020. Reduction is handled in the parallel for level itself. We don't need to go deep. So everything will be handled in the parallel for it. And then, so if if there is, this is only one operation, right? This is a plus operation. So what, what if we need to pass multiple operations? Uh, like we need to have the reduction in place for multiple operations. What we will do then? So that is also enabled in SQL 2020. So as you can see here, we have created accesses uh, for uh, one is plus and another is maximum. So what we are doing is we are finding the maximum and adding together and both for both these operations, Operations. All the reduction, uh, like synchronization related to reduction, will be taken care of uh, as as soon as you pass this accessors here. So that's what reduction is all about. I hope it was clear. If any questions, again, feel free to. Yes, ma'am. Yes, 
so kavita so subarna one question yeah. subarna mm -hmm. one question they're asking can we create our own threads in sickle so probably you would like to um, uh, give more uh, details on the how the thread mappings happen on sickle you yeah showed sure. that uh, this particular on the eu side so and how they can control yeah. with the subgroup uh, probably you had an example how do you create mm -hmm. your own subgroup numbers you can show that okay sure so uh, first thing uh, like i already mentioned all the work group like all the work items in the subgroup execute on a single eu thread and uh, we map each subgroup to a simd len or channel right so all work items inside the subgroup execute on a single EU thread, and uh, what what if we want to explicitly mention the number of threads, right? What we do in that case is mentioning the subgroup number explicitly. So I had an example for that also in the subgroup, as Jyotsna mentioned. So what you can do is uh, you can uh, explicitly like it's an Intel extension till now. It has not gone as a part of Intel uh, like. Uh, specification but what you can do is you can pass this number whatever number you would like uh, the number of threads you want to execute so uh, accordingly you will have the thread generated inside the subgroup so if you it's 16 so in this subgroup you will have 16 threads generated so that's how it works so i hope that was clear this is the way so by default, so there there can be different numbers, right? It can be eight, sixteen, and thirty-two. But uh, if if you by default default it's sixteen only. But you can always mention other numbers here, where, where, whatever you want, and that many numbers will be created. Anything else? I think for understanding this uh, concepts, you will have so many questions and yeah, we are here to answer those. So please feel free to uh, ask me those questions. That's that's the reason I ended the session as fast as possible so that we can take as much questions as possible and clear all your concepts here. Because rather than me speaking one way, it's always good to have questions from you and answer those. So, uh, Subarna, if there are no more questions, should we move ahead with the polls? Okay, sure. So, one last there is, from there is one more question. Just, there is yeah. one last question. I would like to read it from Discord. Somebody has mm -hmm. asked, uh, do we have accelerated package Python uh, package environment for Python included in one API toolkit? Intel has yes. one of its own. So. Yes, we do have uh, Intel optimized Python. When you download the uh, uh, Intel One API based toolkit, it is part of it and you can uh, use it uh, as you would like to. And it also has accelerated uh, packages for um, the scikit-learn, uh, uh, even the math NumPy. So it is part of that uh, Intel optimized Python. So you will get all the best performance. And it is optimized for Intel hardware. So you can uh, definitely get best performance if you run it on Intel hardware. Yeah, let's I think uh, we can go with the poll question. Yeah, Anushka, you can go ahead with the poll questions. Then. OK, so I will launch the first poll then. I hope uh, it is visible to everybody.
attendees i hope you can all see the poll uh, popping up on your screen i see 53% of the attendees have voted so far let's uh, keep the poll open for uh, another uh, 30 seconds and then we will close it Okay, so we have closed the first poll and the result I think should be visible to everybody on their screen. And I think most of them has given the credit results. Hmm. So, uh, Sabrina, do you want to uh, discuss on this question or should we uh, move ahead with the next one? Okay, we, uh, I can just quickly say a line about this question. So, uh, Obviously, the sending order will be in terms of work items, subgroup, work group, and ND range. Uh, as as you remember, always remember the block diagram or the cube diagram that I showed, right? To understand this, so you have a big block, and then that is ND range, a small block. That's the work group, and then a one-dimensional line kind of blocks. That's the subgroup, and then small items in the subgroup so is the work items. So yeah, that's the correct answer. Correct answer. All right, should we go with the next poll now? Yeah, please. Okay, I think the next poll should be visible on your screens now. Attendees will keep the poll open for another 30 seconds. Please send in your responses. Okay, so the results should be visible to everybody now. So, Ben, over to you. Uh, yeah, so the implicit way of the uh, writing is uh, both malloc shared and malloc host. So, uh, and uh, so, uh, sorry, I had made a mistake actually while just posting it. Uh, so it can be both malloc shared and malloc host actually, the implicit way of uh, like writing USM. And the explicit way is actually malloc device. And sorry for the inconvenience there, someone uh, somehow this, uh, this uh, like I, I wanted to write the explicit way of uh, writing USM and it should have been malloc device, but implicit way is ma malloc shared. And I think most of you have answered it correctly. 
and uh, those of you who have answered malloc host that is also a correct answer because both malloc shared and malloc host both of these are implicit way of uh, writing a usm so they take care of, of the memory transfer across host and device and malloc device is the explicit way of writing usm so i think most of them have given the correct answer yeah thanks so uh, since we are done with the poll i will just take a minute to summarize on what all we had discussed is that okay anushka sure sure subhana go on yeah so uh, can you give me the presenter view oh yes just a second yeah. you are still a presenter subhana you can just present your uh, share your screen okay. Okay, I think we have one more question. Kavita, can you read that question out, please? Not visible properly for me. Yeah, maybe we can answer that question. Because, yeah, the question is that sample implementation of a CNN model, uh, for example, ResNet or SquizNet using SQL. Kavita, so, can you repeat this? Uh, in the beginning, I it, the voice broke. Uh, I was not able to hear. Can you please repeat it? Sure. Sorry. So, is there any sample implementation of a CNN model, uh, for example, ResNet or SquizNet, uh, which is using SQL? I am not very sure. We have a lot of sample, but the specific sample that you are asking for, Jyotsna, are you aware whether that is present or not? I can point you out to uh, all uh, the like all the open implementations that we have, all the sample codes that we have. But I am not sure what you are asking for. It's already present. At least I am not aware of that. Um, but yeah, I, I believe can, we can check and come back on that. We, yeah, as Suparna yeah, mentioned, we have a lot of samples which are available in the GitHub site. So right, um, yeah. we can come back on this specific uh, sample, uh, whether it's a yeah, part and of that sample can uh, which is that. there. We can. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So uh, let me summarize on what all we went through. So basically, we went through three major concepts of SQL 2020, and as you saw, all the three concepts has reduced the verbosity and helped us gain more performance out of the hardware in which we are running. So basically, one API implementation of SQL is a standard-based cross-architecture uh, implementation, and it's open source. So we have the support for from the community. We have feedbacks from the community. So it's getting enriched day by day, and uh, it's one step ahead. All like Intel's implementation is always one step ahead because uh, we are extending features like you saw uh, the the way in which we can explicitly mention the subgroup size right that it's uh, specific to Intel it's like that uh, in the last specification subgroup was also specific to Intel but now it's a part of SQL 2020 standard so we work closely to make sure every uh, implementation makes a part of the, our standards and then uh, all of you can post your views after using uh, our compiler uh, uh, the sql language and one api package as a whole any questions any doubts please feel to feel free to post us and regarding this language and uh, our compiler that is uh, the dpc++ compiler is the compiler that we use if you have any question we have open source project please uh, so please try to submit a feature request you can always come back uh, to us also and uh, we will also help you we have a community project also as jotsna mentioned uh, for uh, for you to ask queries and for us to answer them so let's make it a joint effort uh, and uh, let, let's let's make uh, SQL a grand success. Yeah, with that, uh, I would like to end my presentation. Again, last time, any questions, last minute questions that uh, we can address?
Okay. Uh, it's so, not. Uh -huh. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So I was just asking it's... if Kavita can see any questions on the Discord channel. So I think Anushka, we are good. Uh, we have addressed most of the question and um, just a note for all the attendees. We will be on Discord for the next few minutes. So if you have any questions, join us on Discord and, uh, you know, we can help address that or come back to us over the week next week. And, you know, we can still uh, come back and answer to, to some of your questions hosted there. Thank you. Thanks, and, Anushka. And also the community forum is always open also. Like any time you feel you want to raise any question, feel free to post it in the community. Okay, so uh, thank you so much. And uh, so just like, uh, you know, just like uh, Kavita mentioned, there is uh, uh, for you, if there are any questions left for anybody, in case you still have anything to ask, please feel free to move over to the Discord channel and the team will uh, be present there for another couple of minutes to address your questions. So uh, let me wrap up this workshop now by saying that this was an amazing session. Thank you so much, first of all, Jyotsna, for giving a great insight into a, a cycle and, you know, a, an overview of the workshop. And Subarna for taking the attendees through the detailed concepts step by step, you know, from programming languages for multiple architectures and uh, one API resources all the way to language simplification and unified shared memory. I think the workshop has covered a broad domain of topics for the attendees. So thank you so much, Jyotsna and Subarna, for such a fascinating session. I'm sure the attendees have a lot to take away. Also, a big thanks to Kavita, Noor, and the rest of the Intel team who were online with us, providing constant support and assistance through the session. I'd also like to thank all our attendees for such a vibrant participation in the workshop. You've been a great audience. So, but everything is not done yet. Let's hear who the winners are for the Lucky Draw contest that we announced before the workshop. Uh, so, here's the list. Uh, Nikita Avula, Prasanta Kundu, Anirban Malla, Anirban Das Gupta, Ashwin Vijay Kumar, Vidya Sagar M, Rakesh Roy, Kartik Kondinya SR, Rahul Raj, and Shobana Lakshmi Narsimha. So these are the 10 winners who will be gifted an Amazon voucher worth 2,000 rupees each. So congratulations to all of you. Now we would also like you guys to share your feedback for the session. I think Kavita has already shared the feedback form, but we'll again drop the link on the chat window. Please make sure that you give us feedback so that we improve to uh, provide you better. So that will be all for today. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us at this workshop and have a great evening ahead.